Beneath the deceptive calm of the early 20th century, a sinister manifesto was taking shape, one that would cast a long, dark shadow over the world. This was Mein Kampf, which translates to My Struggle, a chilling declaration penned by Adolf Hitler during his incarceration in Landsberg prison in 1924. Within its pages rested the embryonic stages of what would become one of the darkest eras in human history. As Hitler languished behind bars, his thoughts turned to venomous prose, culminating in this two-volume work. The first volume, released in 1925 and the second in 1926, laid bare his twisted ideologies, a fervent belief in the Aryan race's supremacy, a deep-seated hatred for Jews, and an unquenchable thirst for territorial expansion. Little did the world know these concepts would soon transform into the horrific realities of the Third Reich. By the 1930s, Hitler's rise to power saw Mein Kampf become a disturbing harbinger of the horrors to come. The book's circulation skyrocketed, with over 10 million copies in print by the end of World War II. It became a cornerstone of Nazi ideology, its pages fueling the flames of hatred and bigotry that led to the Holocaust, a genocide that claimed the lives of approximately six million Jews. The question lingers, how could mere words morph into the terrifying reality of gas chambers at Auschwitz, the ghastly medical experiments at Ravensbrück, and the ruthless Night of the Long Knives in 1934, where Hitler purged his own ranks? Could anyone have predicted the scale of devastation that these ideas would bring? Reflecting on the wisdom of Frederick Douglass, who once said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men, we are reminded of the crucial role of education and awareness in shaping minds resilient to the siren call of destructive ideologies. Join us on this harrowing exploration into the depths of Adolf Hitler's psyche and the dark legacy left by his most infamous work. Welcome to the Diary of Julius Caesar. Adolf Hitler, the making of a dictator. In the tapestry of 20th century history, few figures loom as large and as ominously as Adolf Hitler. His rise from obscurity to the epicenter of world-altering events is a journey marked by personal struggles, ideological evolution, and a relentless pursuit of power. Understanding Hitler's background is key to comprehending the complex mosaic of his psyche and the ideologies that led to some of history's darkest hours. Born on April 20th, 1889, in Braunau am Inn, Austria, Hitler's early life was marred by familial discord and tragedy. His father, Alois Hitler, a stern customs official, and his mother, Clara Poltzel, provided a household that swung between authoritarian discipline and emotional warmth. The young Hitler's artistic aspirations, starkly at odds with his father's practical career expectations, stirred a cauldron of familial tensions. The deaths of his younger brother Edmund in 1900 and his father in 1903 profoundly affected Hitler, pushing him into a withdrawn, sullen adolescence. In 1907, Hitler's life took a pivotal turn. He moved to Vienna, dreams of becoming an artist in tow. However, his aspirations crumbled when the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts twice rejected him. These years in Vienna were transformative. Hitler lived in poverty, selling postcards and paintings while being exposed to a hotbed of political ideas. The city's rampant anti-Semitism and nationalism seeped into his consciousness, planting seeds that would later grow into the twisted ideologies of Nazism. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 provided Hitler with a sense of purpose he had long sought. He enlisted in the Bavarian army, serving with distinction on the Western Front. The war years were defining for Hitler. He experienced the camaraderie of trench warfare, received the Iron Cross for bravery, and, crucially, found a new enemy in the form of perceived treachery at home. The so-called stab-in-the-back myth that blamed Germany's defeat on internal betrayers rather than military failure. This narrative would become a cornerstone of his later political ideology. The war's end in 1918 left Hitler despondent. Like many veterans, he returned to a Germany he hardly recognized, a nation defeated, economically devastated, 
and politically unstable. The Treaty of Versailles, signed in 1919, imposed harsh penalties on Germany, fueling a sense of national humiliation and resentment. It was in this post-war milieu, amidst the chaotic Weimar Republic, that Hitler's political journey began. Hitler's foray into politics was marked by his early association with the German Workers' Party, which he joined in 1919. He quickly rose to prominence with his fiery oratory and virulent nationalism, rebranding the party as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, Nazi Party. His speeches, brimming with anti-Semitic and anti-Marxist rhetoric, attracted a growing following. The Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, a failed coup attempt by the Nazi Party, landed Hitler in prison. It was during his incarceration that he penned Mein Kampf, a manifesto outlining his ideology and future plans for Germany. The book, a mix of autobiography, political ideology and future strategy, provides a window into Hitler's mind during these formative years. It expounded on his views of race, space and the need for a strong authoritarian leader to restore Germany to greatness. As the 1920s gave way to the 1930s, economic hardship wrought by the Great Depression provided fertile ground for Hitler's message. The Nazi Party's rise in political power, culminating in Hitler's appointment as Chancellor in 1933, marked the end of the Weimar Republic and the beginning of a dark chapter in human history. Mein Kampf and the Weimar Maelstrom, a chronicle of post-war Germany. The environment that gave rise to Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf was one of turmoil, despair and upheaval. Post-World War I Germany, a nation humbled and scarred by defeat was fertile ground for the seeds of radical ideology. The Treaty of Versailles, signed in 1919, had dealt a crushing blow to the German psyche and economy. It imposed reparations amounting to 132 billion gold marks, a sum so enormous that it fueled hyperinflation, wiping out the savings of the middle class and plunging the economy into chaos. Germany, in the early 1920s, was a landscape of political fragmentation and social unrest. The Weimar Republic, established in 1919, was a bold experiment in democracy, but faced challenges from both the left and the right. Communist uprisings, such as the Spartacist revolt in January 1919, and right-wing coup attempts, like the Cap Putsch in 1920, underscored the fragile nature of the new government. It was in this atmosphere of national humiliation and economic despair that Hitler found his voice. The hyperinflation crisis of 1923, where the value of the Reichsmark plummeted and prices soared, created a sense of desperation among the German people. A loaf of bread, which cost 250 marks in January 1923, skyrocketed to 200,000 million marks by November. This economic catastrophe deepened the public's disillusionment with the Weimar government and made them more receptive to radical solutions. Hitler, with his charismatic oratory, tapped into this widespread discontent. He railed against the Treaty of Versailles, which he termed a diktat imposed by the victorious Allied powers, and decried the so-called November criminals, German leaders who had signed the armistice ending World War I. His message resonated with a populace yearning for a return to national greatness. The failed Beer Hall Putsch in November 1923, an attempt by Hitler and his Nazi party to seize power in Munich, led to his imprisonment. During his time in Landsberg prison, Hitler began dictating Mein Kampf to his deputy, Rudolf Hess. The book, which translates to My Struggle, was both an autobiography and a manifesto. It outlined Hitler's radical ideas, including his virulent anti-Semitism and plans for German expansion. Mein Kampf was published in two volumes, the first in 1925 and the second in 1926. Initially, it attracted little attention, but as Hitler's political star rose, so did the book's popularity. By 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, Mein Kampf had sold about 240,000 copies. It became a sort of Bible for the Nazi movement, encapsulating the frustrations, fears and aspirations of a nation still reeling from the effects of World War I and its aftermath. 
From Prison to Print, The Genesis of Mein Kampf. In the annals of history, few books have wielded as much infamy or influence as Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. This manifesto, both an autobiography and an exposition of Hitler's political ideology, was born in the unlikeliest of settings, a prison cell in Landsberg, a fortress prison. Convicted, he faced a sentence of five years in Landsberg prison, entering its gates on April 1, 1924. However, Hitler's time in prison was far from typical. Rather than a harsh penitentiary, Landsberg was relatively comfortable. Hitler was accorded special treatment, receiving various privileges including a spacious private room, the freedom to receive visitors almost daily, and the ability to send and receive as many letters as he wished. It was in these almost leisurely conditions that Hitler began to pen Mein Kampf, dictating the text to his loyal follower, Rudolf Hess. He famously said, I began to write my first work, which I had resolved to call four and a half years of struggle against lies, stupidity and cowardice. A fellow prisoner in Landsberg suggested My Struggle as a shorter and more apt title. The first volume of Mein Kampf was completed in mid-1924 and published on July 18, 1925, by the Franz Erher Nachfolger Verlag in Munich. The initial print run was 500 copies. The second volume followed in December 1926. In these writings, Hitler laid out his worldview and future plans for Germany. The book encompassed a range of topics, from his early life and the origins of his anti-Semitic and nationalist ideologies, to broader political theories, including the concept of Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people. Despite its eventual notoriety, the initial reception of Mein Kampf was lukewarm. The first printing did not sell out immediately. However, as Hitler's political star rose, so did the book's popularity. By 1939, it had sold over 5.2 million copies and had been translated into 11 languages. The book became a staple in German households and compulsory reading in schools. The royalties from these sales significantly contributed to Hitler's income, making him a millionaire. The writing style of Mein Kampf is often described as verbose, rambling and difficult to read. It is a mixture of Hitler's autobiographical experiences, political ideology and future plans for Germany, laced with his vitriolic anti-Semitism and extreme nationalism. The book was used as a tool to spread Nazi ideology, and it played a significant role in shaping the beliefs of the Nazi party and its followers. A notable quote from the book, the personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil assumes the living shape of the Jew, exemplifies its disturbing content. One of the most chilling aspects of Mein Kampf lies in its open discussion of plans for an aggressive foreign policy and the annihilation of the Jewish people. These were not mere rhetorical flourishes, they were blueprints for what would later unfold during the Nazi regime. The book's significance, therefore, cannot be overstated. It offers a window into the mind of one of history's most notorious dictators and serves as a stark reminder of the dangers posed by extremist ideologies. The publication of Mein Kampf marked a turning point in Hitler's career. Upon his release from prison in December 1924, after serving only nine months of his sentence, Hitler found himself barred from public speaking in Bavaria. However, Mein Kampf allowed him to continue spreading his ideas. As his political influence grew, so did the book's popularity, eventually becoming a symbol of the Nazi regime and a key element in the indoctrination of the German people. Dissecting the anti-Semitic labyrinth in Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, a notorious manifesto etched into the annals of history, serves as a harrowing exposition of anti-Semitic propaganda. Within its pages, Hitler meticulously constructs a narrative that demonizes the Jewish population, projecting them as the root of societal and political ills. The book, spanning two volumes, with the first published in 1925 and the second in 1926, presents Jews not just as a religious group, but as a distinct, detrimental race. Hitler employs a mixture of distorted racial theories and personal animosities to propagate his views. He brands Jews as a parasitic race 
a concept echoed in his statement, Whenever I encountered a Jew, I could not help but feel that I was seeing not a human being, but a parasite in human form. This rhetoric is steeped in the anti-Semitic traditions of 19th century Europe, which postulated Jews as schemers, orchestrating global domination. In his pursuit of racial purity, Hitler casts Jews as the antithesis of the Aryan race. He blames them for Germany's economic woes, accusing them of controlling both capitalism and Bolshevism. This dual enemy theory is a strategic narrative, uniting various German frustrations against a single scapegoat. For instance, he asserts, the Jewish doctrine of Marxism rejects the aristocratic principle of nature and replaces the eternal privilege of power and strength by the mass of numbers and their dead weight. Hitler's anti-Semitism also intertwines with broader socio-political themes. He accuses Jews of orchestrating Germany's defeat in World War I, perpetuating the stab-in-the-back myth. This culminates in his belief that the extermination of Jews was crucial for Germany's rejuvenation. He chillingly declares, the struggle for world domination will be fought entirely between us, between Germans and Jews. His personal vendetta against Jews is evident in his recollections of Vienna. He describes an evolution from indifference to intense hatred, attributing it to his perceived observations of Jewish life. This personal angle infuses his political rhetoric with an emotional intensity. He recounts, Once I really discovered the Jews, I gave up trying to find a way of not being anti-Semitic. Reflecting the broader European anti-Semitic sentiment, Mein Kampf found a receptive audience. By 1933, its sales had soared, indicative of a society alarmingly receptive to such ideas. This reflects not just a German phenomenon, but a European-wide cultural and political malaise towards Jews. The book's disorganized structure, a blend of autobiographical elements, political ideology and theoretical exposition, doesn't hinder its impact. Its narrative, though disjointed, successfully communicated its ominous intent, the vilification and scapegoating of Jews. Hitler emphasizes, all this was inspired by the principle, which is quite true in itself, that in the big lie, there is always a certain force of credibility. In exploring Mein Kampf, it becomes evident that Hitler's anti-Semitic rhetoric was not mere bigotry, but a calculated strategy for genocide. The book laid the ideological groundwork for policies like the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, and eventually the Holocaust. Hitler's manifesto stands as a grim testament to the destructive power of hate speech and a cautionary tale about the dangers of letting such ideologies gain momentum. Aryan ideals in shadows, the doctrine of racial purity in Mein Kampf. In the unsettling manifesto Mein Kampf, penned by Adolf Hitler during his 1924 imprisonment in the fortress of Landsberg am Lech, the concept of Aryan racial superiority is presented with disturbing clarity. Within its pages, Hitler extols the Aryans, whom he erroneously claims were the original creators of all higher culture as the epitome of human evolution. He ascribes to them not only physical attributes like blonde hair and blue eyes, a stereotype that became synonymous with Nazi racial ideology, but also intellectual and moral superiority. Hitler states, the Aryan is the Prometheus of mankind from whose bright forehead the divine spark of genius has always sprung, a quote that exemplifies his idolization of this imagined race. Hitler's Aryan ideal is predicated on the notion of racial purity, a theme he obsessively returns to throughout the text. He viewed racial intermingling as an existential threat to Aryan supremacy, arguing that it would lead to the dilution and eventual demise of the master race. His infamous quote, the blood purity upon which its Aryan race's existence depends, is threatened by interbreeding, reflects this deep-seated fear. Contrasting this glorification of the Aryans, Hitler vehemently denounces other races, particularly Jews, as inferior. He pushes a narrative of racial struggle, asserting the need for the Aryans to maintain their purity to continue their domination. This belief led to the horrifying policies of racial discrimination and the Holocaust, underpinned by his declaration, the mightiest counterpart to the Aryan is represented by the Jew. The doctrine of Aryan superiority in Mein Kampf 
was not an isolated ideology, but echoed the racial theories prevalent in the early 20th century. Influenced by the pseudoscientific works of racial theorists like Houston Stuart Chamberlain, whose book The Foundations of the 19th Century, 1899, was a significant influence, Hitler adapted these ideas to a more extreme and political end. Chamberlain, an ardent admirer of German culture, had portrayed Aryans, or Teutons, as culturally and racially superior beings, an idea that Hitler absorbed and amplified. Despite its convoluted narrative and rambling prose, Mein Kampf resonated with many in post-WTU Germany, a country grappling with defeat and societal upheaval. By 1939, the book's circulation had exceeded 5.2 million copies in Germany alone, indicating its widespread influence and the frightening receptiveness of its ideas. In focusing on the Aryan racial superiority concept in Mein Kampf, one delves into the heart of Hitler's twisted worldview. This ideology, more than just a facet of Nazi doctrine, was a driving force behind some of the most catastrophic events of the 20th century. Hitler's vision of an Aryan-dominated world, underscored by his belief that the Aryan stock is bound to triumph, set the stage for the racial policies of the Third Reich, which led to immense human suffering and loss. The study of this aspect of Mein Kampf is crucial, not only as a historical analysis, but as a stark reminder of the destructive power of racial ideologies taken to their extreme. Territorial hunger. Deciphering Lebensraum in Mein Kampf. Lebensraum in Mein Kampf is portrayed as an existential need for the German people, whom Hitler views as superior. He argues that the burgeoning German population, which he estimated at over 60 million, required new territories for sustenance and growth. This idea, rooted in the 19th century concept of social Darwinism, is encapsulated in Hitler's assertion, a people that does not understand or is too cowardly to cut for itself, the slice of bread it requires, does not deserve to exist. Hitler's territorial gaze is firmly set on Eastern Europe, particularly Russia, envisioned as the primary target for expansion. He imagines an Eastern empire providing both the breadbasket and living space for Germany. This expansion was to be more than just a land grab. It involved the subjugation and displacement of Slavic populations. Hitler chillingly notes, We must turn our eyes to the lands in the East. We finally break the colonial and commercial policy of the pre-war period and shift to the soil policy of the future. Criticizing Germany's past foreign policy, particularly its failed colonial pursuits in places like Africa, Hitler bemoans these as misguided. He believed true expansion lay to the East, a vision steeped in historic Teutonic drives towards Eastern Europe, harking back to medieval times. He envisions this as a return to the natural order, stating, the plough is then the sword, and the tears of war will produce the daily bread for the generations to come. For Hitler, Lebensraum was also a justification for aggressive and expansionist foreign policy. He saw war as a necessary tool for achieving this spatial ambition, a sentiment echoed in his pronouncement, war alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the peoples who have the courage to meet it. The concept of Lebensraum, while aggressively pursued by Hitler, had antecedents in German thought. Influences like Friedrich Ratzel, a geographer who in the late 19th century propagated the idea of living space as vital for a nation's survival, and Karl Haushofer, who mentored Hitler's deputy Rudolf Hess, shaped Hitler's thinking. However, Hitler's take was far more extreme, entwining these geopolitical ambitions with his racial ideology. Hitler's Lebensraum policy came to brutal life in the late 1930s and early 1940s. The annexation of the Sudetenland in 1938 the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia, and ultimately the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941 were practical applications of these ideas. The invasion, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, was not just a military campaign, but a crusade for living space, leading to immense bloodshed and suffering. Veiled darkness, exploring the obscure depths of Mein Kampf. A predominant theme in Mein Kampf 
is Hitler's intense animosity towards Marxism and communism. He regarded these ideologies as antithetical to his vision of a nationalistic, racially pure state. This deep-seated hatred is evident in his statements like, the Jewish doctrine of Marxism repudiates the aristocratic principle of nature and replaces the eternal privilege of power and strength with the mass of numbers and their dead weight. Hitler's repulsion towards Marxism culminated in the political purges of the late 1930s and early 1940s, where thousands of communists and socialists were targeted in Germany. Hitler's disdain for democracy and parliamentary systems is another disturbing aspect of Mein Kampf. He advocates for a totalitarian state with absolute power vested in the Führer, asserting, the parliamentary institution is by its nature bound to form the breeding ground for a special form of political lie the lie of the majority. This autocratic view led to the disintegration of democratic institutions in Germany and the establishment of a dictatorial regime. In the book, Hitler extensively discusses propaganda and psychological manipulation. He acknowledges the power of influencing public opinion and details strategies for mass control. One of his notable quotes on this subject is, the broad mass of a nation will more easily fall victim to a big lie than to a small one. This understanding of propaganda played a significant role in the Nazi Party's efforts to manipulate public opinion to support their radical policies. Hitler's views on war and conflict in Mein Kampf are also noteworthy. He perceives war as an essential and natural part of human history necessary for a nation's survival and expansion. He states, war is not something unnatural, in the whole history of man, you will find more wars than years of peace. This glorification of war underpinned the aggressive military strategies of the Nazi regime, leading to the outbreak of World War II. A peculiar aspect of Mein Kampf is Hitler's focus on personal hygiene and health. His personal habits, such as abstaining from alcohol and tobacco and advocating for vegetarianism, are interspersed throughout the text. This obsession with personal purity reflects his broader preoccupation with racial and bodily cleanliness. Lastly, Mein Kampf reveals Hitler's architectural and artistic interests. He had grand plans for monumental architectural projects, intending to transform cities like Berlin into symbols of Nazi power. His personal history as a failed artist in Vienna likely fueled these ambitions. He envisioned architecture as a means to manifest the power of the Aryan race, a theme that resonates throughout his writings. Shadows over Germany, the pervasive influence of Mein Kampf in the 1930s. The transformation of German society along the lines of Mein Kampf's ideologies was swift and profound. By 1933, when Hitler ascended to chancellorship, Mein Kampf had sold about 240,000 copies this figure skyrocketed after Hitler's rise, with the book becoming a fixture in German homes. By the end of the decade, it was almost omnipresent in German society, symbolizing the widespread acceptance of Nazi ideology. The book's anti-Semitic rhetoric, which blamed Jews for Germany's problems and economic hardships, resonated with a populace reeling from the Great Depression and the Versailles Treaty's aftermath. In the realm of education and youth indoctrination, Mein Kampf played a crucial role. It became mandatory curriculum in schools and was a staple in Hitler youth meetings. One of Hitler's quotes from the book, He alone who owns the youth, gains the future, aptly reflects the Nazi regime's focus on indoctrinating the younger generation. This education was not merely academic, it was a tool for embedding Nazi ideologies in the minds of young Germans. The concept of Lebensraum, outlined in Mein Kampf, also significantly influenced Germany's foreign policy. Hitler's expansionist ambitions were evident in his remilitarization of the Rhineland in 1936, a direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. This was followed by the Anschluss with Austria in 1938 and the occupation of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. These aggressive moves, driven by the ideology in Mein Kampf, were precursors to the outbreak of World War II in 1939. Economically, the Nazi regime's policies, inspired by Hitler's writings, 
focused on reducing unemployment through public works and rearmament. The construction of the Autobahn and the establishment of the Reichsarbeitsdienst, Reich Labour Service, were part of these efforts. By 1939, unemployment had significantly dropped from the 6 million mark in 1932, bolstering public support for the regime. Culturally, Mein Kampf influenced various aspects of German life. Art, cinema and literature were censored to conform to Nazi ideals. The book itself became a cultural icon in Nazi Germany, a common wedding gift and a fixture in many German households. This cultural integration helped solidify Nazi ideologies in everyday life. The Machinations of Deceit Unveiling the Propaganda Network of Nazi Germany Under Hitler, who assumed power in 1933, propaganda became a weapon of mass control, aiming to align German thought with Nazi ideology. The Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, led by the shrewd Josef Goebbels, was instrumental in this process. Goebbels, an adept propagandist, controlled all forms of media, shaping the narrative to glorify the regime and vilify its enemies. Under his direction, the ministry orchestrated a relentless propaganda campaign, infiltrating every facet of German life. Mein Kampf served as the ideological blueprint for this campaign. The book, outlining Nazi principles such as Aryan racial supremacy and anti-Semitism, became an indispensable tool in indoctrinating the German populace. Its messages of nationalistic resurgence struck a chord in post-Versailles Germany, contributing to its widespread acceptance. By 1939, the book had become a fixture in German homes and libraries, used both as a political manifesto and as a symbol of loyalty to the regime. The reach of Nazi propaganda extended into all realms of German society. The Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls were indoctrinated with simplified excerpts from Mein Kampf, molding the minds of the young. The film industry too played a crucial role in the propaganda machine. Films like Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will (1935) and Olympia (1938) were cinematic masterpieces that glorified the Nazi party and the Aryan ideal, subtly embedding Nazi ideology into entertainment. Anti-Semitism was a central theme in Nazi propaganda, with Mein Kampf providing the ideological foundation. Exhibitions like The Eternal Jew, 1937, and films such as Jew Sus, 1940, and The Eternal Jew, 1940, were explicit in their anti-Semitic messaging, depicting Jews as subhuman and justifying the regime's racial policies. These campaigns of hatred were not only effective in spreading anti-Semitic sentiments, but also in dehumanizing Jews, paving the way for the Holocaust. Propaganda was also crucial in sustaining German morale during World War II. Despite the worsening war situation and the Allied bombings, the Nazi propaganda machine continued to project an image of strength and inevitable victory. This was evident in the heroic depiction of the German army and the vilification of the Allied forces designed to maintain public support for the war effort. The effectiveness of Nazi propaganda lay not just in its omnipresence, but also in its ability to exploit pre-existing sentiments. It amplified the economic despair, political instability and national humiliation experienced by Germans in the post-World War I era. It also tapped into pre-existing nationalist and anti-Semitic attitudes making the propaganda more resonant with the public. Controversial Echoes The global reception and criticism of Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler's infamous manifesto, has elicited a wide array of responses globally since its publication in the mid-1920s. In Germany, its initial reception was lukewarm, with around 10,000 copies sold in the first year. However, as Hitler's political fortunes rose, so did the book's popularity. By 1939, it had become a ubiquitous presence in German life, with over 10 million copies in circulation. This dramatic surge mirrored the Nazi party's rise to power and its implementation of policies rooted in the book's ideologies. In the United States, Mein Kampf was published in 1933 and quickly sold tens of thousands of copies. 
American intellectuals and the press were critical, highlighting its extreme anti-Semitism and aggressive nationalism. The Chicago Tribune's review painted it as a textbook of mad ideas, arrogant assertions, and bombastic pronouncements. This sentiment was echoed across many American newspapers and journals, which saw the book as a dangerous insight into Hitler's mind. The United Kingdom's reaction was one of alarm and revulsion, particularly after its 1939 publication. British critics and political figures, including Winston Churchill, viewed it as a clear indicator of Hitler's ambitions and policies. Churchill famously described it as the new book of faith and war, turgid, verbose, shapeless, but pregnant with its message, a testament to the growing apprehension about Nazi Germany's intentions. In the Soviet Union, Mein Kampf was banned, recognizing its anti-communist stance and the ideological threat it posed. Stalin, despite his own authoritarian rule, was keenly aware of the challenge represented by Hitler and used the book to understand his fascist counterpart. The Middle East saw varied receptions to Mein Kampf. Translations appeared as early as the 1930s, with some Arab nationalists and Islamic extremists finding resonance in its anti-Semitic content. However, this was not a uniform reaction across the region, with many leaders and intellectuals condemning its ideology. Academically, Mein Kampf has been extensively analyzed by historians and scholars, serving as a crucial text for understanding Nazi ideology and the Holocaust. Despite its importance as a historical document, its use in academic settings is contentious and requires careful contextualization. In the digital age, the availability of Mein Kampf online has reignited debates about historical education versus the spread of hate speech. Platforms and online retailers have struggled with these issues, often choosing to limit or remove the book from their services. Beyond the Reich, the post-war odyssey of Mein Kampf. In the aftermath of World War II, Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler's manifesto, found itself at the center of a global debate on censorship, historical memory, and legal restrictions. The book, which had shaped the terrifying ideologies of the Nazi regime, faced a dramatically different world in the post-war era, one grappling with the aftermath of the Holocaust and the broader implications of Nazi propaganda. In Germany, the immediate post-war approach was to strictly prohibit the distribution of Mein Kampf. As part of the denazification efforts, the Allied powers, who had control over German territories, banned the publication and sale of the book. This ban was rooted in a desire to eradicate Nazi ideology and prevent the resurgence of fascist sentiments in a war-torn and vulnerable German population. The copyright of the book was transferred to the state of Bavaria, which actively sought to restrict its publication. However, this ban was not without its critics, who argued that the book should be available for scholarly study and as a reminder of the past. Elsewhere in Europe, reactions varied. In Austria, Mein Kampf was banned under laws prohibiting Nazi revivalism. France, which had suffered under Nazi occupation, also placed a ban on the book, although enforcement varied over the years. In contrast, the United Kingdom and the United States approached the text differently, emphasizing the importance of free speech and historical scholarship. While Mein Kampf was not widely circulated in these countries, it was not explicitly banned, and academic institutions often held copies for study purposes. The global perspective on Mein Kampf was equally diverse. In many countries, the book fell into a legal and ethical grey area. Countries like Israel, home to a significant population of Holocaust survivors, grappled with the book's painful legacy while recognizing the importance of understanding the roots of Nazi ideology. In the Middle East, some countries saw unofficial translations circulate, often used to fuel anti-Semitic sentiment while others banned it outright. The debate around Mein Kampf intensified as the copyright held by the state of Bavaria approached its expiration in 2015, 70 years after Hitler's death. This expiry raised questions about the book's availability and the responsibilities associated with its publication. In 2016, a critical edition, annotated by historians and meant for academic study, was published in Germany, selling out its initial print run. 
This edition aimed to demystify the text, providing context and critical analysis to counteract the original's propaganda. In the digital age, the challenges of regulating Mein Kampf have become more complex. The internet has made access to the text easier, raising concerns about its use in spreading extremist ideologies. Online platforms and retailers have had to navigate the fine line between censorship and historical education, with approaches varying significantly from one country to another. Divergent tyrannies, scrutinizing Mein Kampf and Stalin's writings. In the dark chronicles of 20th century history, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf and Joseph Stalin's writings stand as profound testimonies to their respective authoritarian regimes. Stalin's ideological treatises, compiled in the 13-volume Works of Joseph Stalin, spanned his rule from the late 1920s until his death in 1953, shaping Soviet policy and dogma. Mein Kampf is an exposition of Hitler's vision for Germany, steeped in Aryan racial ideology and anti-Semitism, marked by phrases like, the Aryan is the Prometheus of mankind. Its aggressive tone and overt racism starkly contrast with Stalin's writings, which, though authoritarian, are rooted in Marxist-Leninist ideology, focusing on class struggle and proletarian dictatorship. Stalin's writing, devoid of the racial vitriol of Hitler's, often invoked Marxist rhetoric to justify policies such as the Great Purge of the 1930s, which led to the death of over a million people. While both leaders used their writings as propaganda, their methods varied. Hitler's Mein Kampf served as a direct blueprint for the Nazi regime's ideology and was integral to its propaganda machine. On the other hand, Stalin's writings and speeches were primarily aimed at reinforcing party ideology among communists, often delivered at party congresses, like the infamous 65th Congress of the All-Union Communist Party, Bolsheviks, in 1930, where Stalin outlined the policies of collectivization that would lead to the catastrophic Soviet famine. The personal element in Hitler's Mein Kampf differs significantly from Stalin's impersonal style. Hitler's narrative includes his personal journey, shaping his political ideology, whereas Stalin's texts, such as his report to the 38th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1939, are more about policy and party doctrine, lacking personal anecdotes or reflections. The impact of these works cannot be overstated. Mein Kampf laid the foundation for the Holocaust and World War II, resulting in the deaths of millions. Similarly, Stalin's policies, underpinned by his writings, led to the Great Purge and the Ukrainian Famine, Holodomor, causing widespread death and suffering in the Soviet Union, with estimates of the famine deaths alone ranging up to 7.5 million. In terms of language, Hitler's emotive, persuasive style in Mein Kampf contrasts with Stalin's often dry, administrative prose. Hitler's rhetoric was designed to incite, exemplified in his rallying calls for German unity and expansion, whereas Stalin's writings, like his 1934 article, The October Revolution and the Tactics of the Russian Communists, reflect a pragmatic approach to governance and ideological enforcement. In comparing Mein Kampf with Stalin's writings, we see two distinct styles of authoritarian control through literature. Hitler's work is a passionate manifesto filled with racial ideology and nationalistic fervor, while Stalin's writings are a blend of political theory and policy justification, marked by their doctrinal tone and lack of personal narrative. Both sets of writings, however, played crucial roles in the shaping of their respective regimes and had profound impacts on global history, serving as reminders of the potent influence wielded by dictatorial leaders through the power of their words. Tyrants in text, unraveling Mein Kampf and Mao's Little Red Book. In the realm of totalitarian literature, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf and Mao Zedong's Quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong stand as monumental texts, each mirroring the ideologies of their authors and regimes. Mao's Little Red Book, a compilation of his speeches and writings, published in the mid-1960s, became a ubiquitous symbol of Maoist China, 
with over 6.5 billion printed copies, making it one of the most published books globally. Mein Kampf is an expansive work that lays out Hitler's vision, steeped in notions of Aryan racial superiority and fervent anti-Semitism. Hitler's rhetoric, such as the personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil, assumes the living shape of the Jew, exemplifies the extreme racism permeating the book. Mao's Little Red Book, in contrast, is a concise collection of Mao's thoughts on communist ideology and revolution. It includes famous statements like, the Communist Party is the core of leadership of the whole Chinese people. Without this core, the cause of socialism cannot be victorious, reflecting the centrality of the Communist Party in Mao's vision. Both texts served as powerful tools for indoctrination within their respective regimes. In Nazi Germany, Mein Kampf was a staple in schools and among Nazi party members, molding the public's ideology. The Little Red Book in China was more than just reading material. During the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 1976, it was a mandatory accessory, serving as a constant reminder of Mao's omnipresence and the principles of the Communist Party. The personal stamp of each leader is evident in their respective works. Mein Kampf details Hitler's early life and his ideological development, blending autobiography with political ideology. Mao's Little Red Book, though not autobiographical, is deeply personal in its reflection of Mao's thoughts and leadership style, representing his unchallenged authority within the Communist Party. The societal impacts of these texts were colossal. Mein Kampf laid the ideological groundwork for the Holocaust, which led to the deaths of six million Jews. The Little Red Book was central to Mao's cultural revolution, a period of intense social upheaval in China, characterized by widespread persecution and estimated to have caused the deaths of millions. In style, Mein Kampf is verbose and dogmatic, reflecting Hitler's attempt to establish a comprehensive ideological framework. The Little Red Book, with its succinct and aphoristic style, was designed for mass consumption, encapsulated by Mao's saying, an army without culture is a dull-witted army, and a dull-witted army cannot defeat the enemy. By comparing Mein Kampf with Mao's Little Red Book, we delve into two distinct yet similarly impactful totalitarian ideologies. Hitler's manifesto offers a detailed vision of racial hierarchy and national destiny, while Mao's text serves as a guide to communist revolution and governance. Both works played pivotal roles in shaping the ideologies of the Nazi and Maoist regimes, demonstrating the profound influence of the written word in the hands of authoritarian leaders. Tangled Legacy, the Enduring Dilemma of Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler's infamous manifesto, maintains its controversial allure in contemporary culture years after its first publication in 1925. This book, which played a critical role in shaping Nazi ideology, has sold over 10 million copies globally, embodying a dark fascination for many. In post-war Germany, the Allied powers implemented a ban on Mein Kampf as part of the denazification efforts. This remained in effect until 2015, when the copyright expired. The subsequent release of a critical edition in 2016, annotated by historians, was met with both interest and controversy. This edition aimed to provide context and critique to Hitler's ideology and sold over 85,000 copies in the first year alone, highlighting the persistent interest in understanding this dark chapter of history. Internationally, the book's reception varied significantly. In countries like Turkey, Mein Kampf experienced a surge in popularity, becoming a bestseller in the early 2000s, with reports of selling 100,000 copies in just two months of 2005. This sparked concern over its potential influence on extremist ideologies. In the Middle East, the book has been distributed in various forms, sometimes being used by radical groups to propagate anti-Semitic views. For example, in 2002, a Lebanese publisher reported selling 10,000 copies annually. The ethical complexities of Mein Kampf stem from its dual nature as a historical document and a manifesto of hate. 
While historians emphasize the importance of studying the book to understand the roots of Nazi terror, there is an inherent risk of its misuse to further extremist agendas. The advent of the internet has exacerbated these challenges, with online platforms grappling with issues of censorship and historical education. The moral responsibility surrounding the study and dissemination of Mein Kampf is a subject of ongoing debate. Some argue that engaging with the text is necessary for critical analysis and denunciation of its ideologies. Others caution that any form of engagement could inadvertently lend legitimacy to its hateful messages. As we close this exploration of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, a text that has echoed through the corridors of history with its dark ideologies, it's crucial to remember the lasting impact of such writings. Penned in the shadows of Landsberg Prison in 1924 and published across 1925 and 1926, this manifesto became a cornerstone of Nazi ideology, leaving an indelible mark on the world. It's a reminder, as Winston Churchill once wisely noted, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. From its chilling advocacy of Aryan supremacy to its vehement anti-Semitism, Mein Kampf not only shaped the trajectory of the 20th century, but also serves as a stark warning of the power of words and ideologies to influence and corrupt. As we turn the final page on this chapter of history, let's carry forward the lessons it imparts, ensuring that such darkness does not find its way again into the narrative of our future.